How is it going guys and welcome back to another video over here on YouTube. If you want to learn how to play small stakes PLO successfully, then this is the right video for you to watch as we are playing a 50 cent a dollar across four tables on WSOP.com. And in this video, I will discuss the most common mistakes people make when it comes to playing these kinds of stakes. So stay tuned. We already have an action pot in front of us. We call a squeeze with queen, jack, eight, nine. This is a hand we don't want to bet on the flop necessarily because if we get three-way action, we're usually in very bad shape. However, against one player, our hand tends to be good. I mean by good, I mean good enough to get the money in. Equity-wise, we need here about 38% equity or so. We can call or just jam. I think if we call, the idea would be to fold a hard turn, which I think is a pretty reasonable plan. Okay, let's go for that line. Beautiful turn. I'm going to shove in the last $34. And wow, this is, this is, this is a good start into the video for multiple reasons. This guy just called the squeeze with really good aces. And then we both turned ace jack but we did river the straight so this is a pretty incredible start and already shows how unorthodox these games can be when you are playing low stakes plo now this video can also be helpful if you are playing in home games so live games basically but also in low stakes live games like one two and two five where you do see a bunch of limpers and players play not gto or game theory optimal but they have sort of their own lines. They they learned how to play the game by teaching themselves or just through experience. And in the process of doing so, they generally tend to make a lot of mistakes. And in this video, we will talk about what those mistakes could be and how to exploit them. Here at Call in the Big Blind, we certainly have a hand that could lead out on the flop. But I think by the time we bet the third time, we usually um, are in kind of trouble spot. And because our hand doesn't really turn that well and river as well, like we are not holding the nuts on the flop and our chances of making the nuts on the turn of the river are quite small. And that's usually something you want to think about when it comes to building a pot. Here on 24 big blinds, I don't necessarily want to raise very often, like limping is the primary strategy. Because when you raise and your opponent three bets on such a short stack, you're usually in a quite crappy spot with a lot of different hands. Your maneuverability against aces and high cards is quite limited. So therefore, limping is the dominant strategy. At 100 big blinds, it's a different story. Over here, we do see a limp by Elon in the small blind. And we go for the eyes ourselves. And we flop two, a top pair, a top two pair, and a seven and a club. So we have a multitude of blockers here, which uh, want me to bet, basically. And that kind of like touches on an interesting uh, concept or principle just in general. In PLO, you usually have different forces that sort of work sometimes against each other. Like sometimes you have, for example, a hand that does well checking back, but kind of also does well betting because it does block your opponent's continuing range. And it's on you to understand through the process of analyzing your hands with a solver, for example, talking with a coach or watching coaching videos, which force is the dominant force in the decision-making process. Should you go ahead and see better hand or check back is oftentimes dependent on multiple factors or forces that you have to weigh against each other. And that's pretty much what we're going to do in this video. Review hands where we do make that decision. And hopefully we will run into a lot of interesting spots. I mean, the first hand was actually quite interesting. We might review that in a second. But if you guys like this video, this format specifically, looking back or, or reviewing slash playing low stakes poker and giving tips and advice for low stakes players, then make sure to smash the like button and also subscribe to the channel in case you haven't so far. So that gives me a signal that you want to see more of these kinds of videos. Uh, so here we open with, we have top pair, right? And an open ender. So now we have to ask ourselves again, we have a pair, we have a hand that could protect against over cards, for example. I'm going to check back here for the sake of like not running down my time bank. And at the same time, like if we get raised on the flop, right, we are in pretty big trouble against such a small turn, but we're going to call. So there are two forces here. On the one side, we want to protect our hand. On the other side, we also don't want to get check raised. And that's the thin line we very often are going to walk and decide then on which 
which side of the line basically is better. And it oftentimes comes down to how valuable the free card is in the turn. If it's very valuable, we also call these hands turn determined hands, then the EV, the expected value of the free card is very high and that's competing with the EV of betting. So one, ask, one question you can ask yourself is, how many turn cards can I turn basically that are gonna make my hand a lot stronger or a lot weaker? Good examples are, for example, backdoor flush draws, specifically backdoor not flush draws, or very valuable clean over cards. Uh, those are strong indicators of turn determined hands that usually want to see the turn and don't want to get check raised in the flop. It's especially true with hands that can't or shouldn't call a check raise in the flop, but can improve a lot on the turn. Kind of like this hand, we have aces and deuce four. We don't want to get check raised on the flop. We can turn the up flush draw, we can turn some straight draws, and of course we can turn top set. And at the same time, we're not blocking our opponent's check raising range, which is another fact that we can talk about in just a bit. So here we call a three bet, and our opponent is very shallow. So uh, what you need to know uh, a lot about in PLO is sort of the bread and butter skill set is understanding equities, right? And the thing about equities is that on the one side, you have your equity versus your opponent's range, which is important piece of knowledge to estimate. Uh, it's an important skill set to learn. And then on the other side, you also have the stack to pot ratio, which determines how much equity you require to get the money in. And that's an important piece of information that you, or uh, it's more like a skill set that you need to uh, do very well in when it comes to pot limit Omaha, because PLO is a very equity driven game, which means that equities matter and drive the action most of the time. So you, you need to be on top basically of what the current equities are and how much equity you need in different spots. So for example, if your opponent shouts in on the flop for a pot size bet, right? So getting two to one, then the stack to pot ratio is, t is one. And that means that you need 32% equity to stack off. So you need to understand, first of all, that 32% equity is required. And then second there, you need to be able to estimate with a good level of precision how much equity you have with your exact hand against your opponent's shoving range. Here, the player on the button limps and we raise. We have king, king, five, three. Now, we certainly have a little bit of blocker effect in play here with the king of diamonds, but I don't think quite enough to justify betting. We're still like not blocking any pair or straight draw. We have one diamond, but no 10-9, for example. No six. Uh, on the turn, very happy betting after the flop goes check, check. Let's see what my opponent is going to do. He's going to call. We don't river a straight. I think the best course of action right now is to check. It's a bit thin to bet for value. We don't have a seven, obviously, and we also have no straight. And our opponent actually checks back with 997 deuce. Like one thing about low stakes live or online is if you're able to enter the pot with a proper range slash with a range advantage, then you already have an automatic, very large edge over the field. So it's what a lot of people underestimate. For example, when you look at live poker, which is similar to small stakes poker when it comes to the meta, so the way people play, people are not patient enough to really wait for the hands that are good enough to enter the pot. They might also not know exactly how good of a hand they kind of need to enter the pot. But at the same time, even if they would know, I kind of doubt that too many players that are recreationals are, or you, you can say like recreationals that aren't trying very hard, would even want to wait long enough to actually get a hand that, can, that they can play. You know, who wants to play? A V pip of 22% or 24%. Uh, over here we call a squeeze. So we raise a little bit of a marginal hand on MP, and we do get the three bit by the small blind and cold called or over called by the big blind. Very clear call on our end. And then here on the floor, we have a straightforward fold. This guy has a bit more than a pot size bet left, right? So if he had a pot size bet left, we need 32% against the betting range. Uh, but because he has a bit more, we need something along the lines of 35%. In this case, like probably like 34%, and we clearly don't have that, so it's an easy fold. Over here, single raise pot, we, fe we face two checks, and um, we're going to go for a third pot size bet. We have a pair and an up flush blocker. Now, this hand class, for example, an up flush draw, could also check back in various circumstances. For example, if we had already a pair, we have a bit more showdown value, and we also have bowed outs, which are very valuable, and of course, the up flush draw on top of that. 
But also one thing you will see in low stakes is that people are very unprotective of their checking ranges. So once they do check on the flop or the turn or the river, they tend to overfold massively. And that allows us to apply aggression when they show weakness. It's a very straightforward concept, but it's important to also understand the reverse. When your opponents are betting, they're usually very sticky at these stakes. And when they're checking, they're usually very, very weak. And the implication, of course, there is that when they do bet, you don't really want to screw around. You don't really want to attack their betting ranges and you want to attack their checking ranges very aggressively with a wide range of hands. It, 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 I mean, if, if you even spin it further, it also means that when you do have a very strong hand, it could also make sense to slow play a bit more often against players who check fold very often. Here we um, attack the check back range and then get there on the river. Go for value and bet. And we have a couple of playable hands here. So this is a button versus big blind scenario. We flop two pair. Not really much reason to bet. It's not like a lot of weaker hands are going to call us. Like even if a weaker hand is going to call us, like a flush draw, for example, or just an ace, they oftentimes find ways to bluff us out of the hand. And our hand is not going to, like our hand is not going to make a good bluff catch candidate on almost any run out. Um, so building a pot and kind of like maneuvering ourselves or forcing ourselves into the scenario of becoming uh, or have or, or getting into a spot where we will have a bluff catcher in a larger pot than sort of necessary is already like kind of a bad situation. So here we face the river bit very small. This could be done by like any two pair or straight. So there are a wide range of hands that could be betting here. However, we don't need to win very often. So I think it's an okay call. Also because we do block three pair. I mean, we have three pair blockers. So like our opponent can easily have, in this case, just like a one pair hand that is turning into a bluff. And of course, we don't have to win very often given the price at hand. Okay, so we're gonna move on over here. We defend against the min race and we do flop pretty nicely, middle pair and a straight draw and a flush draw. However, our hand has a lot of trouble making the nuts. So again, we want to ask ourselves, do we want to build a pot right now and then potentially play for stacks by the river or by the turn? And the answer is very clearly no with this hand. Going to check the turn. And now um, I'm not going to bluff the river. I think my hand is going to lose a fair portion of the time. However, how often are we going to have the straight that is check on the flop, especially ace queen, like not very much. His open raising range is going to have a lot of ace queen, but also like king queen and queen jack hands that are not going to fold against the bet. This is a tricky spot. Flop goes check around. The small blind now pot size leading on the eight. Not a great spot. Obviously, we were beating pocket jacks and pocket queens. Getting two to one here with a player behind. I think we're going to let this one go. This is a conservative fold, um, but I do think it is a good one. And over here on this table, we are leading out into three players with a big hand. Which kind of brings me to another principle. Like when you play live poker or low stakes, you want to lead a lot more often than you probably are doing. Like you're not going to check the, the preflop razor in multi-way pot. Like that idea is not really, it's not valuable or actually going to lead you to make a lot of mistakes. If you have a good hand in a multi-way pot, you generally want to bet yourself because the preflop aggressor is not incentivized to just bet like a bunch of hands. He's going to get called or raised very often when he does so. Uh, River the second nuts on the seven of spades. Now we want to ask ourselves, should we check call? Should we bet? Um, so queen 10 busts, 10 nine gets there. Obviously some spades will get there as well. 10 high spades, jack high spades. There are quite a few flushers that can like value cut themselves. A few. Um, it's not only about him holding the jack high flush. It is also that if we don't have the jack or the 10 of spades, those are good cards to be bluffing with in case he missed something like queen 10 with the queen of spades. Um, against a large bet, I don't think check raising is the smartest play. We're just going to call. And our opponent does show down the exact hand that I was mentioning there when he when he's holding the ten of spades or the jack of spades he has a reasonable bluff that we can then catch by not going for the bet but by going for the check 
So obviously we're playing a bunch of tables here and there are a lot of concepts coming together. But in this hand, the thing to take away was basically that every card in your hand matters when it comes to making decisions. And of course, con um, computing basically the relevancy of every card is hard. It's tough. It's a tough game, right? There are 200, I mean, there are more than 200,000 combos of, of different pot limit Omaha hands that are possible. And like they interact with the board and, and make every spot basically unique. But what helps us to understand how every individual card plays a role is or our concepts, basically, like understanding concepts. What do we want to get called by? What kinds of hands slash blockers is my opponent going to bluff with? And then putting the, bus, the puzzle together, basically, by um, applying the concept to a situation that we haven't studied, but we have studied the con and understood the concept. Uh, this is another single race part. This player, Big Bob, uh, who flatted the aces before, went for the min race, and we go four ways to the flop. I'm going to pot the turn here with top pair and a wrap. We can also dominate uh, hands like Jack, 10-9, for example. That can still call or might still call. So pretty standard stuff so far. And as you get more familiar with these concepts, you um, learn how to apply them in various situations. But more importantly, you also become a more equipped thinker, right? It's not about blindly applying a concept. It is about the forces. It is about understanding how this force is pulling you into one direction and another one and another. So you have like an argument in your head, basically. Oh, we could be betting for what reasons? Well, we need some protection. Our hand is turning well. Our hand can call a check raise. Our hand is blocking the check raising range, right? Versus, well, my hand is also good as a bluff catcher. Once we check back, we can like bluff catch with our low flush, for example. Our hand is not blocking the check raising range very much. Like there are different arguments, basically both sides, and you have to weigh them and become a judge. And by working with solvers and coaching videos, shout out to PLO Mastermind, of course, you will learn more about how to become a critical thinker and become better equipped using those uh, tools, like a tool belt, basically, in order to make strong arguments both ways and then weigh them properly. That's really what it comes down to. And when you look into a solver, that's basically what you see the solver doing as well. It's like, where is the threshold between a hand that is just weak enough but has enough blockers to justify going for the semi-bluff bet or the, the, the hand that kind of has some value in getting called but is folding versus a check raise? Like, where is that line? And uh, that's what you can basically learn with precision from a solver but you as a human have to extrapolate the concept behind it because the solver cannot create concepts, can only put out or spit out combos and EVs. Three betting here, ace, ace, queen, nine, snap, four bet by my opponent at 100 big blinds. We're not going to find a call here. We're always going to just jam all in. And our opponent should show up with a bunch of aces. Wow, that's a sick, uh, sick run out we flop trips i mean why not okay a little bit of a hot run here at the small stakes on wsop uh, over here i called the small bet against the min race we see a large bet on the flop and a call with three pair i it's tricky like i can see the solver like raising and then folding versus jam here with a hand like this um but i'm just gonna call like there are so many bad turns even if i just call even if I, if I raise and get called, there's so many bad turns, actually, that I want to keep this pot out of control. Of course, we are dead against pocket aces or pocket hands, pocket nines. But also, the hands, like other hands that will give us action will have a ton of equity against us and are much less likely to make mistakes on turns and rivers than our hand, which will largely remain unimproved. Check the river... So 6-8 and Jack-8 got there on the turn. Obviously, we still lose against sets. Are we going to face a bet? Like, Wolf wasn't betting turn, so really hard to believe he's going to hold Jack-8. Like, pretty much impossible. Representing at this point 6-8, pocket tens. We don't block 6-8, which is not great, but is he really checking back 6-8 on the turn? I think this sizing is, like, indicative of not, like, someone that doesn't bluff. 
Um, so that really sucks because I kind of want to call and I think I will call, but timing wise and sizing wise, not too confident. So we have to win here by 25% of the time given the sizing. Mm. I don't know. What do you guys think in the chat? Let me know. We're going to make this call. And we do run into the 8-6. Unsurprising. I think 8-6 with the king high flush draw can definitely go for a turn bet. And over here, we call a 3 bet. Check, check on the flop. Pretty nice hand to semi bluff on the turn. Hmm. The free card is worth quite a bit, but I think people are also very unprotected in a, in a, in a spot like this. Uh, over here, interesting spot. So single raise pot, we bet the flop uh, with ace, king, six, three pair, get raised by the small blind and pushed for a hundred bigs by the big blind. This is a clear fold. I mean, this guys, these guys might go crazy, but whenever they, they're not, wow. Like in this case, we're just drawing that basically. And in this case, we were drawing that and we got away here from top two against top set, which was just flatting pre, which is another shocking thing. Um, and bottom set. So pretty good fold there. I mean, we got the strong signal, of course. Should we check call here on the flop? I think with our not at the back door equity, and um, we're going to call. Even though the betting position was kind of large. Now betting the turn quick as well. Like what kind of hands are betting here? Probably 10, 10, 10, 7. Queen 10 could be in there. Bunch of club combinations with like big draws. Um, we are behind against range at this point, but we are priced in to call. River is a 6. Not looking good. We're losing against Queen 10. Not a huge surprise. I think we played the hand quite standard. Again, flop is a little bit debatable, but usually we just want to call there and not fold as we are moving to our next hand or some some like multiple next hands. Okay. Button limp. Something you generally want to avoid by the by the way. I think we're gonna just punish this. I think we saw Elon limp before like 9973 single, so like not every limper limps 80% of the hands. Like you have to be careful and attentive to understand how wide someone is limping before you start eyes raising with sort of a wide range of hands. For example, ace queen 10 4 try suited here. Our hand is like a pretty wide ISO. It's not a normal ISO. Okay, so our hand doesn't have much benefit in just checking. Um so we're gonna go for a bet. Like we we can't check call. But we can turn good sometimes. Uh, on the six, I don't think we should represent much. It's not like four or five is much in our range. So I don't think we will get a bunch of credit for that. And also when we get called, we are completely unsure about when and where to barrel. We have no good blocker like for the river. Again, you can convince yourself that the four is a great blocker. But when you think about your perceived range, people are not going to give you credit here for a, for a straight. And uh, at the same time, we are almost drawing dead against, uh, we are very like drawing very thin basically against the continuing range. It's, it's going to be hard to basically make good decisions on the river. And, and that's also like something a lot of people kind of miss out on is to be selective with what hands they get involved with, even on the flop or the turn, like start folding early. Because a common mistake people make is to kind of, call the flop and see what happens on the turn, give up too often, see by the flop white, not knowing what to do on the turn, like basically inflate the size of the pot without a plan. And then they usually end up folding at some point in the hand, and but after kind of building the pot basically. And that is an easy way to lose a bunch of small pots and then bake in the long term. Okay, we have some action pots over here. We three bet eight, seven, five, four. I think this hand is not a hand to generally three bet, but I'm giving a little bit of action here. In the meantime, we do check back on this hand. I think this is also a hand you can easily just check back on the flop three ways. But anyway, I don't think my slightly too wide C bets are going to get punished much basically by the player pool. 
Uh, Potting River, I don't know what's going on here, but we're going to call, obviously. And we do win. And in this four bet pot, easy, get it in. If we don't run into hearts, we're going to crush equity wise and, and sp into spades. And in this case, uh, we did. And we end up winning the $274 pot. Moving on to this hand, we three bet the small blind and get called by the button. Should we barrel again? I think so. I'm going to go ahead and barrel. Um, it's I'm not super confident about this spot because we have no club. But we, yeah, I mean, you're also blocking queens. It's not an amazing spot. It's kind of a close between between the options, basically. If it is close between the options and the side note, generally I would um, be more on the aggressive side and win pots that way. It's better to lose like a pot by being a little bit too aggressive than just like folding a bunch of small pots by being too passive. But of course, that's a big generalization and you still want to be careful uh, and, and basically make decisions that are primarily based hand by hand. Like, again, concepts are valuable, but applying concepts correctly is where the true gold is. All right, let's see if we can find like another interesting hand to close down this video. I don't want to make these videos too long, but again, if you guys enjoy this kind of content then leave a like and subscribe as well. Um, so that I know that I should be making more of them. A check, check on the flop, check, check on the turn, and check, check on the river. I don't know why this guy keeps checking. It's time to get value at some point. I mean, at the river. I would also attack the turn there anyway. And not defend pre flop. But again, people are making mistakes across the board which is very common. And if you play solid and if you know how to use concepts correctly, you're going to be successful at this stake, especially if you're consistent as well with it. If you're consistently making good decisions or better decisions than your opponents, uh, you're going to be in good shape. Open race the cutoff, ace nine, ace 10, nine, six, try suited. And on these Broadway boards, I will pretty much check my entire range and take it from there. Half pot size stab, middle pair, gutter, and backdoor, not flush draw, is going to be one of those hands that is like close to indifferent, which means that the EV between calling and folding is, is close. It's like not a great hand to continue, but also a little bit too good to fold. Now we're facing another barrel on the Ace of Diamonds. So... Tricky about this is like at this point we're basically beating like pocket kings and uh, which not too many people are like stabbing correctly here. And then I guess like some straight draws but there aren't really that many. I'm actually going to fold my hand. Because we're not blocking any of the value but also we're fat, like we're very far behind against value. And then lastly we don't have a hand that does well here calling basically any river, I mean, unless we improve, which is very unlikely, or which happens very infrequently. So making an earlier fold is uh, is generally the way to go in those scenarios. Again, you don't really want to play call call fold a bunch. It's an easy way to lose a lot of small pots. Uh, over here, playing blind on blind, our opponent stabs the flop and bets turn kind of small. Uh, we don't want to get in all the stack here. SBR 9 is like an overplay is going to go for check call and we end up winning this hand maybe the last hand is right here um raise in the small blind at this phase player is very short so we'll go for the race and um, now i can only shove or check back i think with my hand i'll just check back and see some turns because my hand is very turn determined and there are a bunch of turns that I'll give my hand a very strong hand, like this one. 
uh, or that destroyed my hand completely, like a four, for example. So my decisions, my decisions on the turn are going to be very clean and good. And that's what I'm aiming for when I take a free card in this spot. A very long tank. I don't know what's happening there. Over here we bet after checking back the flop. This is a hand. Kind of want to check back on the flop three ways. As we are planning to sit out and to catch some good hands. Still awaiting. It's a long time bank. Okay. Okay. All in. There we go. Guys, hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see each other in the next one. This has been Jane Anders. Over and out. Talk to you soon.